Introduction to Logic. I'm Mark Thorsby, and this is a course which overviews the basics of categorical, propositional, and predicate logic. Um, today we're looking at basic concepts, in particular we'll be looking at deduction and induction. Okay, let me start off with quickly and say that what have we looked at in our first two videos here? First we talked about what arguments are, uh, and we we, first, we talked today about what arguments are, and we talked about the idea that arguments have both premises as well as conclusions. That's what the P stands for, and the C is for conclusions. Um, and um, we also talked about how to recognize arguments and differentiate arguments from non-arguments. Uh, some of the other things we've also covered so far is the difference between formal and informal logic. Um, we, when we talked about, when I made that distinction and sort of talked about it in the video, I mentioned the idea that uh, formal logic t is, is deductive logic, and informal logic tends to be inductive logic. Okay, So today we're going to try to begin to explain a little bit in greater detail and clarity the difference between deduction and induction. It's uh, because there are deductive arguments and there are inductive arguments. There are good deductive arguments and there are very poor inductive arguments. Uh, but the distinction between the types of reasoning is very important. I should say here that we're today we're because we're we're using the Hurley textbook. We're just talking about deduction and induction. There is philosophers have debate and have a discussion about whether or not there's a third category in terms of the type of reasoning. Uh, and some people in in here we would talk about abduction, which is a different form of reasoning. Uh, but we're not going to get into that now. Everyone agrees it's because there's debate about that. But everyone does agree that there is a difference here between the types of reasoning between deduction and induction. Okay, uh, let me try. Let me just start off before we sort of give you examples of what deduction and induction are. Let me give this. Let me just sort of define it. Deduction here means reasoning that occurs by necessity. Oops. Reasoning by necessity by necess relationships within the ideas you're talking about. So that's reasoning by necessity. Whereas induction is reasoning, let's say, by probability. So let me give you an example here of reasoning by necessity. Um, for instance, mathematical reasoning is reasoning by necessity, right? Um, if I write to in, uh, if I make a mathematical argument, there can only be one correct conclusion. That's because so for instance, and this isn't really an argument, but let's say two plus two equals four, right? If I was to explain that in an argument in a forum, right? Um, the only conclusion could be right. I guess the argument could be you have one thing, you have another thing, therefore you have two things. Okay, I guess that's a deductive argument. That you can only get one conclusion because of the rules of arithmetic and because of mathematical rules operate out of necessity. So deduction is reasoning by necessity. You always think, of course, about Sherlock Holmes as a good example, right? Uh, where Sherlock Holmes deduces, meaning that he goes to a crime scene, he looks at what's happened, and then he figures out, well, what could have got it? I think one of the uh, examples is Sherlock Holmes finds a woman who's been strangled. Right, uh, but she has little dots all around her neck, right? Which indicates the deduction is that the strangulation occurred with something that has lots of beads on it. Thus, it was a, a necklace, right? But that's where you you reason uh, what has to necessarily be the case, such that um, well, it has to be necessarily the case given the set of ideas you're taking a look at. Whereas by contrast, induction this is reasoning where you. Um, where you don't know necessarily, but you can make an argument out of probability, right? So for instance, I could say, the sun has come up yesterday, and the sun came up every day before that, therefore it's likely that tomorrow the sun will come up. That's an inductive argument, it's a good inductive argument, but it's inductive because it's only probably the case. And so actually, interestingly enough, all, almost all arguments that have to deal with time um, tend to be um, inductive arguments because of probability. In fact, the here's an interesting question you might ask: Is what is modern? What do modern scientists use? Do they use deduction or induction? Uh, because um, when you, because most scientists they learn 
right? Uh, or not they learn, they run experiments, they observe the experiments, and then they try to figure out what has to be the case, probably so. So some experimental science is inductive, but then the mathematics of experimental science would be deductive forms of reasoning. So it's actually sort of a combination, which is pretty interesting. Um, so how, do, how can you figure out whether or not an argument is deductive or inductive? Right, so here I'm going to draw a little circle. How to determine the difference How to determine the difference? Uh, ultimately, I mean the first. I mean the first sort of thing you could do if you're not sure would be to see if you can find any indicator terms. Um, and we've looked at indicator terms in our previous lessons, right? Um, indicator terms, right? Because of the difference here between necessity and probability, uh, right? Reasoning by necessity and reasoning by probability. You can imagine there's a whole series of indicator terms. That are related to necessity, right? If someone argues X, Y, Z, thus necessarily it is the case that that's obviously a deductive argument. Or if someone says it's probably the case, right? That uh, sounds like an inductive argument. So you can we're going to take a look at some of the indicator terms uh, for those. In fact, here I guess I can sort of show you here. Uh, this is again 1.3 from the Hurley text, but he does talk about indicator terms, right? Uh, here are some some general ones it's improbable it's plausible implausible likely unlikely reasonably to con reasonable to conclude um, you could have problem uh, if you have necessarily in the conclusion and so on and so forth um, if you claim to deduce for instance as these are indicator terms but the problem with indicator terms is remember uh, the diff the difficult part about translating ordinary language arguments is recognizing the difference between statements Right, the difference between statements and propositions, and we—it's uh, probably worth reviewing that difference. Uh, part of the reason I review this stuff as we go is so that way you can also re recall here and sort of generally learn how all of this stuff's related. Remember, statements refer to the actual words that are used, right? So the statement actually relates to the sentence and the syntax, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Whereas the proposition here refers to the meaning of what is meant by the word. So the difficulty with indicator terms is indicator terms generally tell you, they give you a clue, but they actually refer to the statements. Uh, whereas deduction and induction really refers to the propositions, to the meaning. So indicator terms is the first way you can go if you're not sure. But I mean, importantly, right, you should do other things. For instance, you should assess uh, the, the actual truth of the inferential length, right? You should assess um, the actual truth of the inference, uh, and that is the inference between the from the premise to the conclusion, right? And that's the question: is well, is this is this actually necessary, or is it merely? Uh, or is it merely conceptually necessary, right? Uh, so you want to ask the sort of, is it actually necessary or is it only actually probably the case, right? So, but the difficult thing here is, of course, as soon as we start talking about actuality, the question is, well, right, for instance, if I make the previous argument about um, going, what was the argument? About the sun coming up tomorrow, right? If I take that argument, uh, and I have to assess the actual necessity or probability of it, right? I have to look at, for instance, how I know that the sun came up and have all these epistemological and maybe empirical claims that I suddenly have to verify. Uh, so this is sort of difficult. In many cases, it's very difficult to assess the actual truth of the inference. Uh, but for many arguments, you'll know whether or not it's by necessity. So, but in only a handful, you'll maybe have trouble with, I think. Uh, Let's change this here. Okay. The other thing here is to assess the form of the argument. The form of the argument. You can assess the form of the argument. Uh, and, and I sort of relate when I talked about formal logic, right? Formal logic occurs when you symbolize the terms or uh, you symbolize the units of conceptual measurement. 
and then you search to discover if there's a formal relationship that is necessarily the case, the necessary moves from truth. So it's something like this. A deductive argument is one in which the, the conclusion necessarily follows from true premises, whereas a inductive argument is an argument in which the conclusion probably follows from um, the premises, right? So you can take a look at the form of the argument. And in fact, most of what we do in this course is uh, we're going to be assessing the form of deduct of arguments and assessing their deductive quality. That's pretty much what we're going to do today. Or not today, but within the course, especially when we get into categorical logic and, and predicate logic. We're going to be looking at form, form, form. We're not going to really care about the actual truth of the inference so much. Um, we, when we talk about existential fallacy, we will. But so those are some of the ways to determine the difference. Okay, so let me go up here now. And let's sort of go over what I want to give you here is a list of common argument forms. Actually, I'll just pin the middle thing. A list of common argument forms. Okay. And let's start with, I'm going to give you a list of common deductive as well as inductive argument forms. But let's start with the deductive. Right. Again, I always have to apologize in these videos. My handwriting is atrocious, especially on this computer. Uh, but let's start with this. Obviously, we sort of talk about arguments by mathematics. Um, right. Mathematical arguments are by definition deductive. Why? Because in mathematics, you have certain rules and operations that you have that can only work in one way with the numbers um, or the numerical digits you're calculating or symbols or whatnot and so but they can only work in one way which means they exist they operate out of necessity or they're deductive right so there's arguments by mathematics right arguments by definition are deductive arguments by definition uh, oh, one thing I should mention, though, is that when I talk about deductive arguments and I say mathematics, we should we should um, we should we should separate out here um, arguments that are by probability, mathematical probability. So this is not statistics. Um, I should mention that statistical arguments are inductive arguments, even though they use numbers. Um, so. We should be sort of clear there. I'm not talking about statistics. But anyway, going back to arguments by definition. What's an example of an argument by definition? Um, you could argue, for instance, well, let me give you, let me actually jump up here to the example that we get here from uh, arguments by definition. Uh, well, here's, here's the, let's sort of take a look at what Hurley writes here. Um, Okay, an argument from definition is an argument in which the conclusion is claimed to depend merely on the definition of some word or phrase using the premise or conclusion. For example, someone might argue that because Claudia is mendacious, it falls that she tells lies, or that because a certain paragraph is prolix, it falls that it is excessively wordy. That actually, I'm not sure if that really is a very good example. It doesn't clarify too well, right? But for instance, it's imagine, for instance, if I say... Um, if in order to make my argument, my conclusion is based upon the definition of a term or something like this. Uh, so if I say, um, I uh, say there is a thing right there that ha that has three sides. Is it there's a, no, if I say this, there's out there a polygon that has three sides on a two dimensional plane, right? And, and thus that thing is a triangle. Right now, that argument is a deductive argument because basically what I what it, what I argued was the my my premise there was the definition, <laughs> right? So arguments by definition, for example, are arguments that are also deductive. So let's take about number three here. Also, syllogistic arguments, and you're going to see we're going to go over this, especially when we look at uh, Aristotelian categorical logic, um, syllogisms. Right, syllogisms. Now, real quick, what is a syllogism? A syllogism is an argument with exactly 
two premises, right, and a conclusion, and one conclusion. Okay, that's essentially what a syllogism is. There's different types of syllogism, though. Syllogisms, though, right? Uh, or at least we'll say this, at least for the purposes of this book. Uh, a syllogism will we'll define it as a, an argument with two premises and one conclusion. Now, that let's give some examples here. First off, there's what we're going to see are categorical syllogisms. A categorical syllogism we'll see is a syllogism that relates um, at least three categories together in some way, right, in order to make a conclusion. So a categorical syllogism is when you're talking about all of a category or a, what, at least one member of a category and then trying to make arguments in that fashion. For example, if you say all men are mortal, Socrates is a man, therefore Socrates is mortal, right? That's a syllogism. There's two premises and a conclusion. And it was categorical because I'm talking about the category of human beings, the category of things that are mortal, and the category of people called Socrates. So that's a categorical syllogism. Um, Hurley here says you can sort of catch a categorical syllogism by if you see these terms, right? All men are mortal, or if you see things like some person's name, Socrates, etc., etc. That oftentimes if you see the language of all or some, then you're suddenly, or if you, or also, yeah, uh, that generally speaking, you're, these are going to be categorical syllogisms. Now we're going to see there's a whole brand of logic called categorical logic here, uh, in which we'll spend all of our time just talking about this. Uh, but that's not for quite a while. Uh, other types of syllogisms, there's also hypothetical syllogisms. A hypothetical syllogism which basically has this form because it's two premises and inclusion. It says basically if A, then B, if B, uh, then C, therefore, if A, then C, right? So this is a hypothetical syllogism, right? It has this particular form where it's composed of two, three different conditional statements, right? I remember, I hopefully you remember this, in a conditional statement, this was something we covered in our last lecture, in a conditional statement, this is known as the antecedent, right? And this is known as the consequent, okay? So, but how does the hypothetical syllogism work? Basically, it says if you have if A, then B, and then B, then C, you can just create a shortcut between A and C, right? Where you can just make, simplify it and therefore conclude with a different condition, which is if A, then C. So this is a hypothetical syllogism, okay? It could be something like this. If Joe does his homework, then Bob will probably do his homework too. If Bob does his homework too, then Charlie's likely to get an A. Thus, if, um, I forgot what I named A. If A does his homework, then Charlie's likely to get an A or something like that. So that's a hypothetical syllogism. The last type of syllogism here is a disjunctive syllogism. A disjunctive syllogism and for this one I want to actually jump down here and show you some of the examples here um, that um, that Hurley gives right a disjunctive syllogism is a syllogism having a disjunctive in it a disjunctive is an either-or claim so and think about it here when you talk about disjunctive um, right it's an either-or sort of claim it you well it uses statements that take the form of either or right and think here disjunctive it sort of almost means to uh, think about a, a junction where something switches uh, but it's not quite related so that's how i sort of would make sense of that term if i just heard it for the first time disjunctive is sort of means things are sort of related but disjoined in some sense and it basically means either this or this or both right and there's actually two types of disjunct disjunctions um, there's inclusive as well as exclusive, but we'll come to that later. So here's a good example here. Either, either global warming will be arrested or hurricanes will become more intense. Global warming will not be arrested. Therefore, hurricanes will become more intense. Okay, so that's a disjunctive syllogism. And, it, and generally speaking, disjunctive syllogisms are deductive because of their form. Now, but not in every case. 
uh, same thing with hypothetical syllogisms. Again, what we have to be careful here is always to look at the what we talked about here up here is remember it's the proposition that we're actually have to assess in terms of figuring out what is deductive or inductive. But these are whoops. Uh, but these are common forms, right? Um, these are common deductive forms. Okay, now let's quickly let's sort of talk about well, what about what are common inductive forms? Common inductive forms. Um, now here's let's quickly what well let me get started with this. A common inductive form here is an argument by analogy. An argument by analogy. Now, but let me say this too. Dedu you can see even already when we talk about arguments by necessity, we can look at the argument form and it really helps us. Whereas inductive argument, I said, is is more related to informal logic in general. Uh, why is that? That's because in order to know if something probably is the case, you have to know something about the thing you're talking about in particular. So, for instance, an argument by analogy is an inductive argument because it's not necessary. It just points towards the probable, right? So a, a famous, famous argument by analogy is the argument for God's existence, often referred to here as the watchmaker argument. And the watchmaker argument for God's existence goes like this, right? Imagine you're, this is a sort of rough version, imagine you're sitting on a beach or walking on a beach and you suddenly see a watch, right? The watch, because it's so contrived, right? It has um, a sort of contrivance to it, right? Because of this contrivance, you recognize that the watch is not just a piece of shell, right? You know that, that it's actually something that's been created, Right? Because it's so contrived and designed, you assume there's a designer or a contriver. Right? And so, but what about the world? The world seems very contrived too, very complicated. For instance, oftentimes people will point to the, the mechanics of the eye and look at how complicated and intricately, um, well, it almost looks as if it's designed because it's so intricately complex. Right? And such that if you say that, well, wait a second, if there's contrivance, in my eye, if there's biological contrivance, then there must also be a contriver, right? Thus, if there's a watch, there's a watchmaker. It seems that if there's a world, right, with science that we recognize contrivance and complexity, then it would seem that if there's a world, there's also a world maker, right? This is a famous argument for God's existence. The thing to recognize, though, is it's an argument by analogy. Because what it's saying, how does an analogy work? Right. Well, let's take the watchmaker argument back as an example. We said since there's a watch, there must be, uh, we'll say there's a watch, so thus there must be a watch maker. Right. Um, so, and the analogy works like this. And the, the reason you can re there must be a watchmaker is because we had the notion of, we'll say complexity. Um, I think it's better aptly put as contrivance, but we'll say complexity there. And then we take a look at, here I guess I'll throw it right out. Then you take a look at the world, and it looks like the world also has a high degree of complexity or contrivance. Thus you conclude that there must be a world maker, right? Um, so, but this is an argument by analogy. It's saying that because there's one relation in the case of A, there must, and there looks like to be a similar relation in the case of B, we can conclude this, right? Now, that may be a good argument, but it's only an argument by probability, right? Because there's nothing about watches and watchmakers that necessitates that a god exists. Uh, there's nothing necessary there. It's purely an argument by analogy, okay? So in many, and I think the majority of the arguments you probably hear are actually inductive arguments. Arguments that operate by prediction, right? For instance, the weather. This is an inductive science, and thus inductive arguments, right? Um, we all know that the weatherman has really good reasons for saying that it's going to rain tomorrow, but we all know that it might not, right? And that's because we know that it's merely uh, that uh, weathermen are merely operating by probability, right? That's because. Uh, weather science today is an inductive enterprise. We observe weather patterns and then we try to see what's going to happen in, 
tomorrow, right? If we can sort of recognize the patterns, we can predict what happens. The difficulty thing, the reason predictions are totally inductive is because they depend upon um, experience, right? Because they depend upon experience. Um, and my experience doesn't grant me insight into the necessity of how things operate, right? Um, so this is, there's much deeper reasons we could go into here and talk about predictions in induction. Uh, in fact, there's a famous problem of induction by um, a well-known philosopher by the name of David Hume. So if you're interested in this, take a look at David Hume's work um, because he's sort of the premier thinker of, of I think, induction. Uh, interesting, I guess I could mention, well, maybe I'll mention it at the end here. Um, there's also arguments by generalizations. By generalizations. For instance, uh, over the last couple of years, um, there's been lots of arguments about uh, the Middle East and, um, right, lots of arguments about the Middle East and how the peace process in the Middle East is going to happen and this sort of thing. But there are actually, I think, arguments that are by generalizations, right? Because there's arguments, for instance, uh, where you generalize a, uh, a class difference and then make an argument from that. For instance, in Syria right now, they talk about the Alawites, right? The, 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 the sort of civil war that's emerging there is becoming a war between the Alawites Right, in another class or category of people. But that, of course, is an argument that gen and then, of course, because they're in a, there's a class warfare, the war is going to, such and such is going to happen because of the war. Right, arguments of that type are arguments that operate by, generaliz by generalizing. Right, and let's see, there are some generalizations that are very bad, right, hasty generalizations, and but sometimes it's necessary, and many times, oftentimes it's necessary, and it's actually good reasoning to use generalizations. So we have to be a little bit careful here, right? Because, um, I mean, the sort of dark side of arguments by generalization is sort of when you end up uh, with sort of bigotry and big uh, reasoning that's bigoted in a certain sense, where you've generalized a whole category of people. For instance, in the 1970s, um, homosexuals were often said to be violent, right? Uh, and because there obviously there had been some, there was always going to be some cases of crime that some perhaps related or committed by people who are homosexual, but then that would be overly generalized to the entire population and say that we shouldn't allow um, homosexuality because then we're going to allow it'll cause crime or something, right? Those are arguments by generalization. Uh, those are bad generalizations, but on the other hand, there can be good generalizations. For instance, zoological generalizations or ecological generalizations. Um, for instance, you might say that pollution is bad for the environment. In this case, in these particular cases, thus pollution is probably always bad for the environment. That's probably generally a good generalization, uh, or at least it's an argument by generalization. Of course, we always need more specifics. Arguments by authority, right? Uh, these are arguments that are also inductive, right? For instance, an argument by authority would say, for instance, um, um, economists argue that if uh, we don't get the debt um, under control, that the United States will um, cascade into bankruptcy. Thus, we have to um, overcome the debt problem because, right, the authorities say we should. So that would be an argument by authority. Not a very good argument since I'm sort of making it up as I'm talking into the screen. Uh, but that's an argument by authority. Uh, you have to be careful because it's inductive because just because someone who's an authority or someone who has experience or knowledge says it doesn't mean it's true. There's lots of things get taught at colleges and universities that aren't true, right? Hopefully not many, but there are things that get taught that aren't true, right? Uh, and people believe in those sort of untruths continue because of the sort of assumption of authority. So you have to be careful is that because they're only probable doesn't make them actually necessarily the best arguments. Um, Hurley talks here also about arguments by signs, arguments by signs. An argument by sign would be saying that because I've seen something that indicates something else, then this must be what had happened, right? So arguments by signs, that's sort of when you sort of, or these are, way you think about this, these are arguments that are based upon interpretation, which I think may be a more helpful way of understanding what is meant here. 
Um, right, arguments of interpretation are hermeneutical arguments or arguments by science. These sorts of arguments are also inductive. Um, because to, to interpret is it to necessitate something, right? Um, also, here's arguments by causal inference. Causal inference. Now, here is where you might be sort of surprised. Causal inference, here we're talking about causality, right? We're talking about cause and effect, right? And arguments by cause and effect are actually inductive arguments. Why? Because, as we mentioned before, cause and effect can only be observed ex through experience. Right? So, and this is sort of related to David Hume, actually. Right? Causal arguments are arguments that relate to cause and effect. So, for instance, imagine, for instance, if I click a button on my computer right now and it stops the video recording. Uh, in my experience, I'll have caused an effect, right? Uh, where event A caused, caused event B from cause to effect. Uh, but the thing is, I don't necessarily... So if I make the argument, um, if you press that button, you'll turn off the computer. Thus, you shouldn't press the button since I want to record the movie, right? If I make an argument of that sort, right, the basis of the argument is the idea that there's a causal inference here uh, between what I do. The thing here is that if I press the button, I don't. how can I know that that actually causes the effect? In an ordinary sense, in terms of my experience, but do I observe the causation itself? Uh, the answer is I don't. And since I keep, don't observe the causation myself, that means I don't actually observe a necessary connection because we uh, there's no observation of necessity itself. Um, since I, and this is sort of a deep idea here, and um, I'm planning on in the future posting a lecture on this, so maybe this will make more sense if you listen to that. Uh, but it means that we don't actually observe the necessary relations between events themselves. Because of that, right, causal, it's only out of probability. Um, here, again, what I want you to do is, if you have time, take a look at the work of David Hume. And in particular, look at his argument here about causality, right? Look at David Hume's discussion of causality. Um, And one thing I should mention here is that whenever I sort of reference someone, I may not have time to actually put it in the notes uh, or go over all the details, but you can always use the Internet Encyclopedia of Philosophy or the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy and just look these people up and find out more details about this stuff. So, but anyway, take a look at that. So causal arguments are also inductive arguments, okay? So this is some of the bare bones, but that the way back to the basics here is the deduction involves necessity, right? And induction involves probability. So that's the difference that you have to make here, okay? So, and also, from the classic times, there's also been a debate here about whether or not deduction is really something like reasoning from the general to the particular, and induction is something like reasoning from the particular to the general. These are good general ways of thinking about maybe the difference between deduction and induction. But as Hurley notes, it's not necessarily correct. Uh, so that's a sort of uh, a long-held discussion within philosophical circles. So what I want you, what do I want you to do now is now that we've, that's essentially what 1.3 is all about. What you need to do for the exercises, if you're going to be doing the exercises, is you're basically going to get a list of arguments and you need to figure out whether or not they are inductive or deductive arguments and then if they are inductive or deductive if you recognize their form you need to write down what the form of argument is let's just start with the first one here just so you can get an example because triangle a is congruent with triangle b and triangle a is isosceles it follows the triangle b is isosceles that is what do you think that is is that deductive or inductive answer is it's deductive okay it's deductive, not simply because it's a mathematical argument, which it is, right? Um, but specifically uh, because it's related to the form of the argument. It's using a deductive form of argument. Let's skip here down to a different one here. Uh, 
The Matterhorn is higher than Mount Whitney, and Mount Whitney is higher than Mount Rainier. The obvious conclusion is that the Matterhorn is higher than Mount Rainier. Is that argument deductive or inductive? It's deductive, right? It's a deductive argument because it's based upon the necessity of relating the categories of the matter of Matterhorn, Mount Whitney, and Mount Rainier. Let's. I want to find an inductive argument here. Cholesterol is endogenous with humans, therefore it is manufactured inside the human body. Okay, that's a deductive argument by definition, right? Um, let's see. They thought because the apparent daily movement, which is common to both the planets and fixed stars, is seen to travel from east to west. But the far slower single movements of the single planets travel in the opposite direction from west to east. It is therefore certain that these movements cannot depend upon the common movement of the world, but should be assigned to the planets themselves. And that's from Kepler, right? Is that a deductive or inductive argument? Okay, I'm going to conclude there. I'll let you answer that in the note liners, okay? Uh, but that's um, 1.3, the difference between deduction and induction. Thanks again, and I look forward to seeing you guys. Um, next time with our next lesson here, we're going to take a look at 1.4. This is an introduction to logic. See you online.